Would you open your Bibles with me tonight? Matthew chapter 8 is our text. Matthew chapter 8. If you have found it, please say Christ-likeness. Uh, would you rise with me as I read God's word tonight in reverence to his word? When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up again and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirit with the word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take your seats. O oh Lord, we come before you in Jesus' mighty name asking the spirit of the living God to fall afresh upon each heart. Your word is life. Your word is power. Your word brings conviction. May your word go out in power today by the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Help me to be the first listener and the speaker of your word. And may all of our hearts be tender to receive what you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we are looking through the ministry of Jesus through um, uh, Matthew chapter 7 and chapter 8. And as you all know, that Matthew is written to the Jews. So it's written in that context. Uh, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever experienced a, a face palm moment in your life where you felt like, oh my goodness, I really messed up? I really messed up. Anybody? Yes. Okay. All of us have. <laughs> um, imagine somebody that has been healed and they, they have now uh, been healed of um, being lame all their life, not being able to walk, and now they can walk. And the first thing that they do after they receive this healing is to go to the edge of the cliff and say to oneself, now let's see how well these legs work and jump off the cliff. Now, we don't want to imagine what happens to the guy who jumped off the cliff. That's not the point of the story. But the point of the healing is, what are you going to do with the healing? That's more important. For Jesus has come to save and to rescue the lost, and that is a spiritual healing, in a sense. And today we'll find Jesus, in a very unconventional way, healing Peter's mother-in-law. How many of you have good relationships with your mother-in-laws? Anybody? I do. Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, many of you here, praise the Lord. Um, we can see that through today's text that Jesus has been uh, ministering, preaching the gospel, healing uh, the person with leprosy, healing the servant of the centurion. And today, at the end of the day, he comes into Peter's house where his mother-in-law is laying sick. In the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that Jesus saw her. And in the Gospel of Mark and Luke, uh, we learn that uh, Peter and Andrew have asked for Jesus to heal. And either way, it's okay because Jesus is going to do what God has purposed for him to do. God is going to do what God has planned to do. Whichever way we try to fit it, God will have his way. That brings such a delight and an affirmation into each of our hearts. Why? God is sovereign and God is Lord over all things. Jesus comes into this house. In verse 15, we read this. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. Luke, who is a doctor, a medical doctor by trade, writes this in his account. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. But just before that, Luke says that fever was a high fever, which means this fever was not just a little bit of a temperature. It's more. 
It could be symptoms of a, of a worse disease. And yet, Jesus has come. He sees that this person is in need of healing, and he touches her. And the way he uh, gives this healing is quite uh, unconventional. Uh, we've seen the unconventional ways Jesus has uh, done healing. Uh, nowadays, you think, well, what's, what's so wrong with this guy, Jesus, touching the hand of a lady? It, it's a no-no in Jewish custom for a man to touch somebody else's wife, right? It, it's, it's a no-no. And yet the Bible teaches us that in Matthew, he touched her and she is well. And then uh, in the Gospel of Mark, he takes her hand and lifts her up. This tender touch of Jesus comes from a place where you need to realize that he is at the end of his day. He has been preaching the gospel. He's been healing many people. He's been casting out demons. What do you do at the end of your full work day? Anybody? You want to do the dishes for somebody? No? You want to put your feet up and rest, right? Most of the time, basic human instinct shows that when we are tired, when we uh, are just deprived of all energy, we, we need to feed ourselves, we need to get some sleep, we want to relax and rest. What does Jesus show? He not only shows compassion, praise the Lord, well done. He not only shows compassion, he is willing. He doesn't do this begrudgingly because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Which brings us to the title of tonight's message. We are healed to serve. The purpose of our healing is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Is to serve the kingdom of God. Is to serve the church that God has given us. Is to serve a broken world that is all around us. Is to serve. That is the purpose of our healing. The purpose of our healing is not to go out and do more sinning. God forbid. Can I get an amen? Not to do more sinning, not to do more bad things. But the reality of God's touch upon our lives is to get up and serve. And this is exactly what Peter's mother-in-law shows us. In verse 15, the latter part, the fever has left her. The healing has come upon her. What does she do? She gets right up and begins to wait on Jesus. The serving aspect of this woman's faith has come forth. She doesn't say, well, I'm all healed now. I'm going to put my feet up, and I'm going to eat whatever I want to eat. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Rather, this woman's faith causes her to wait on the Lord, which means to serve. And this, this healing that happens inside the home begins to impact a community. Because look with me, verse 16. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. This is Jesus, right? And he drove out the spirits with the word and healed all the sick. Did, did the word of God say healed some of the sick? All the sick, amen. Thank you, thank you. Just checking if you're awake. Jesus, while he is being served by the mother-in-law of Peter, is able to continue to do what he needs to do with his gifts and graces. So that serving from the mother-in-law energizes and enables and empowers Jesus to be physically renewed. By the way, Jesus is fully God and fully human. People think that Jesus felt no hunger while he was on this earth. That is false. Jesus was hungry. He's fully human. He understands how we operate because he's been us. He knows what it's like to live with flesh. He knows what it's like to lose a loved one. He knows what it's like to be deprived of, of sleep. He knows what it's like to be deprived of food. He knows hunger. He knows pain. He knows suffering. By the way, he knows betrayal. The closest people around him would run away at that very hour when he probably needed them the most. And still, Jesus would continue to love, continue to obey, continue to fulfill the Father's will. 
Yes, it's incredible that we just imagine how Jesus lived on this earth, a sinless, selfless life, always focused on loving other people. And perhaps for us, those who have been healed with the encounter of Jesus, by the tender touch of Jesus, I don't know how you came to Jesus, but I know one thing for sure, that we have encountered Jesus in our lives, and that's why we're here tonight. And that encounter, that healing, causes us to be propelled to do what? To do exactly what Jesus did, serve others. Jesus didn't say, I've clocked out. My time is up. I'm not going to heal anybody. I'm not going to cast out any more demons. But we can see from the service of Peter's mother-in-law that Jesus continues the ministry. I love this. Many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. Why? Because other people couldn't do a thing with demon possession. Some scholars say that people in this area suffered a lot from demon possession because this particular area, they messed a lot with magic. Doesn't it sound like the area that we live in? Isn't this a timely word for today? You bring any demon-possessed person to any other kind of thing. And by the way, uh, I, I don't you know, deny medicine and, and help in that realm. I don't. But when everything is labeled as a mental disease, we, we have to understand demons exist to haunt and terrorize and to bring people to steal, kill, and destroy people. In one session of um, deliverance, uh, I, I witnessed this person, and, and the demon was speaking through this person, of course, for our fight is not against flesh and blood. Can I get an amen? Right? And, and, and this demon was so upset. Of course he was. Why? This demon had come into this person many, many years ago to kill this person. And this demon, as he was commanded in Jesus' name, up and out in Jesus' name, the demon went out, and, and the demon was so upset, angry. Oh, my goodness, I was hiding so well until the light of Jesus shone into this person's heart, and I was found. And then the light shines. Then what happens? The darkness must flee. When the light of Jesus shines upon a soul's heart, the darkness must flee. So Jesus casts out demons Why he has compassion on those who are bound to sin, who are bound to oppression, who are bound to depression, who are bound, who are bound to their own thinking, that they're labeled by the doctors. So that's how they identify themselves. I am ADD, ADHD, ABCD, whatever the thing is, right? I, I am this. When Jesus comes in contact with that person, they are free, hallelujah. They're able to see freedom for the first time. All this time, this person had been medicated, medicated, and medicated by the things of the world until the real medicine comes from the divine healer himself. And cast the demons out in Jesus' name. Of course, Jesus doesn't need to say, in Jesus' name. He is Jesus. Go out, he says, amen. And the demons leave. Hallelujah. For us, we must embrace the name of Jesus. For there is no other name by which we are saved. It is the name of Jesus. It is in his power, in his name, by his death and resurrection, by his blood. He not only heals delivers, but he also heals the sick. And then verse 17 says this, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. What was spoken through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53? He took up our infirmities and bore our disease. By the way, when Jesus heals, there is a transaction. This touching of Peter's mother-in-law, is a method that Jesus uses to show the Jews who are reading this account from Matthew that touching the unclean woman, because if somebody is sick, they are called unclean, it does not defile Jesus. 
The illness does not defile Jesus. The fever does not come upon Jesus. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. The sickness does not come on Jesus. Rather, the wholeness of Jesus is given to this woman, this lady in suffering. And what does Jesus do? He takes on that infirmity. Isn't that beautiful? That picture alone, that image alone of this prophecy in Isaiah, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases, and by his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we, because that's what the prophet Isaiah spoke thousands of years ago. So that God's revelation and prophecy would be fulfilled through the Messiah King, Jesus Christ. By the way, our healing, our salvation is not based on because you're a nice person or you're a good person or you helped an old lady walk across the street. Of course, that's a nice thing to do, but that does not have any input into your salvation. Our salvation comes only through this Messiah the Messiah who took up our infirmities, this Messiah who long suffered, this Messiah who laid down his life on the cross for our sins so that the death and the, and the doom and the gloom of hell that you and I deserved will be transferred, that he would take it on himself and he would give us what? Purity, righteousness, holiness, joy, and the list goes on and on. Once we realize this truth, then we receive this healing salvation, which is a spiritual healing. And in this case, it, it continues, it bubbles over into a physical healing. But what do you do with that healing matters so much. What we do with what Jesus has done to us, has given us by his grace, is to serve others. Not for self, but for others. Think of a tree bearing fruit. Does the tree eat its own fruit? Have you ever seen an apple tree eat its own fruit? That would be very weird. It doesn't happen in the natural realm, okay? It doesn't happen maybe in your fantasies. A tree, a fruit, is always given for others. This healing that we have received, this touch that we have received, this word that we have received, from Jesus, especially in this day and age of so much darkness and, and magic and voodoo and Ouija and all of these things, right? We need Jesus. We need to invite Jesus. If you see on the, on the scale of how this woman was healed, Jesus was invited into this home that she's living in. Who are you inviting into your home, the home of your hearts tonight? Who are you inviting? If you're inviting demons, they will build and build and build. They will steal and steal and steal. Kill, kill, destroy, destroy. They will continue to do what they do best. But when you invite Jesus into your heart, into your life, into your home, into your mind, into your imagination, do you know what happens? There is healing, friends. There is deliverance. There is wholeness and newness and purity, righteousness. There's something that's birthed within us that we cannot e never imagine. Would you invite Jesus into your imaginations tonight? Don't just dream pizza dreams. There's nothing wrong with pizza dreams, but I'd rather dream God dreams. Can I get an amen? amen. It's a waste of time, pizza dream. Never going to happen. Amen. Human dreams. What good is that? I want to dream God dreams. I want to see God's vision. I want to see God's prophecy come alive in my own life through the word of God. I want, to, I want to eagerly desire the gifts. I want to bear the fruit of the spirit of God in my life. I want to be more like Jesus each day. And then with that, I want to serve. If I'm not healthy, I cannot serve. Can I get an amen, right? I've been... Uh, reflecting uh, a lot this week. I, I've had a little bit of a setback on my health, physical health, and, and so I've been reflecting a lot that by God's grace that he has allowed me to preach on Sundays and Wednesdays and lead early morning prayer meetings. 
and Sunday night prayer meetings by the grace of God. For the, since 2015 plus, until now, that's, that's around nine, nine years ongoing. And although I've had setbacks in my health, but the kindness of the Lord has held me behind this pulpit. And I gave praise to God for that. It is a blessing that the servant of the Lord is able to share the heart of Jesus through the preaching of God's word. But I need to tell you one thing. It is not an easy position to serve the Lord as the preacher of the gospel. Do you know why? Many reasons. One, the word is heavy. The word of God is not a lightweight. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and it's not even a heavyweight. This is the heaviest, the strongest, and it's the most potent. And for somebody to come under God's word and to, and to be called to preach, it is not an easy role. It is not an easy position. Because you see me up here and, and share, you're like, well, that's what he does for a living. So he, he works 40, 40 minutes a week, and that's, that's what he does. That is not the case. If any of you think that, you, you are delusional. <laughs> Try being me. <laughs> but because there's a calling, God gives me the grace to come under his word. And sometimes the word is so heavy, I'm like, God, I can't breathe. You need to give me the grace to be able to share this word, but also, do you know that there is such a strain in my life that I want to live out this word, not just preach it? Do you know that there are many preachers who just preach and tell you to do stuff, but they don't do it? I don't want to become one of those. I don't want to become a hypocrite for the sake of my own salvation and for the goodness of your souls. I believe that you deserve the very best, the very best meal, and a good meal, if you think about culinary skills, you prepare good ingredients. <laughs> the best in the whole wide world, in the whole universe. And then I come under the word. I say, Lord, what do you want me to share with your people through what you have written? And then the Lord grants me ideas and thoughts. I write those down. I pray and I say, Lord, I can't preach this. Can I, I can't live this. And then the Holy Spirit embraces me again and says, listen, preach it. And then you continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling with the word of God. And I say, yes, Lord, but I'm weak. I can't do that, Lord. I'll give you the strength. Go forward, my son. And the reason why I get to serve this congregation and love you as God has called me to is because I have encountered the healing that has come to my own heart. Jesus' healing is causing me to serve others, not because I have done much good things. No, it's because of the grace afforded to me. And by faith, I declare to you tonight that our God is sovereign and he will have his way and this church will continue to stand upon the word of God. Amen. You can pull me out of this pulpit, but I will still preach the gospel. You can do whatever you want. You can say bad things. It, it doesn't matter. I still love you anyway. God is on the throne. And he wants us to be healed, to serve. There is a broken and a dark world out there that needs the gospel, needs Jesus so desperately. Without Jesus, they're all going to hell. Oh, my goodness, pastor. Did you just say hell? Yes, I did. It's in the Bible. I didn't make it up. There's only one way. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. And that's what I give to you. Only Jesus will save us. Only Jesus can heal you of your disease. Not only physical, but some of us mental, some of us spiritual. Only God can fill that hole. <laughs> only God can fulfill that yearning and longing, that hunger that you have. I visited my, my primary care doctor today, and uh, it's been a while since I went, uh, but I had to go. I, I was summoned to go, so I did. And before I went, I prayed for my doctor. Do you pray for your doctors when you go? Amen. Yes, you do. And uh, we were chatting, and um, he's like, 
yeah, I think uh, you need to make a little bit of uh, life changes and you, you may need to take, you know, some medicine and whatnot. So I said, uh, doctor, I will agree to making the life changes, but I will not take any medicine. And then he laughed and he said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. Where do you pass? At the Danvers Church of the Nazarene. And you should come too. I've been praying for you. He's like, whoa. Okay, I go to a church down there, but uh, I'll check you guys out sometime. And I was talking with this, this doctor, and I just felt God's compassion upon this man. And at the, by the end, I said, listen, if you really want me to take some medicine, and I will. But I'm not going to take all of it. I'll just take a little bit. And if you're in my shoes, what would you do when he said, I'd take some medicine? So I'm going to take some medicine. You can keep me accountable. But what I'm trying to say is this. This person who has come to heal me, and I believe that God uses doctors and nurses and medicine. Can I get an amen? amen? Praise the Lord. He does. He also heals instantly if he wants to. This person who has come to heal me, and at the end of our meeting, he says, Pastor, I think I'm going to check out your church because I have a heart for ministry. And he came to shake my hand. So if all of my health ordeals were for just this one meeting, it's worth it. Why? Because I am healed to serve. You are healed to serve. Because one cannot give what one does not have. But one thing I do have, silver or gold, I do not have. But I, what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, let there be healing, deliverance, salvation. In the name of Jesus, through him alone, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my strength, my shield, my song. My cornerstone he is. And friends, I'm not fearful of what is ahead. Because the grace that God has led us through it's the grace that will lead us on. Yeah. And I believe with all my heart that God is going to continue to heal you and me so that we can be servants of the Lord, to serve people, to love people, to lay hands in, and pray for people, speak words of hope to people, words of prophecy as the Lord grants it to people. Use your gifts and graces for the kingdom of God, not for yourselves. So what's the conclusion? Maybe some of us are reluctant to heal, uh, reluctant to serve, because you are still spiritually sick. And if that is you, invite Jesus into your heart. Invite Jesus into that place of deep hurt and pain and trauma and PTSD and say in Jesus' name, Lord, would you heal my wound? And if you need to go back to your earlier years when you were five-year-old, six-year-old, go back and say, Lord, heal me of this memory that haunts me, of this memory that scares me. Oh, Lord, heal me of this disease in Jesus' name so that I may serve you better. Maybe some of you are reluctant to serve because you are still self-focused rather than others-focused. Jesus was never focused on himself. He's always wanting to serve. That is why he is the epitome of agape love, wanting the best for the other. Maybe we are reluctant to serve because we have truly not encountered Jesus. And for those people who feel like, oh, I don't know who this Jesus is. Again, before this day ends, before you go to bed tonight, just in the quietness of your own space, say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Show yourself to me. And let him minister to you. I find it remarkable that the prophecy that Isaiah gave in Isaiah 53 is the prophecy that continues to speak a better word to us today. It is not just done and then we just forget about it. We need continuous healing, friends. Some of these things that just come up we need continuous healing and his touch. And I wanted to read Isaiah 53 as the conclusion of my message tonight. If you want to turn to it, you can too as well. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him 
like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hallelujah and amen. Let us pray. Jesus, touch our hearts once again with your word, with your embrace, with your power, with your great love. You know exactly what is going on inside our minds, inside our imaginations, inside our hearts, inside our bodies. You know the circumstances that we are faced with. Despite all of that, O oh God, we trust in your sovereign will and thank you for allowing us to meet with the word of God tonight, Jesus Christ. Let Jesus come alive. Let Jesus speak into the darkness. Let Jesus embrace our deep hurts and wounds. Perhaps for some of us, oh God, the shame and the guilt is so heavy that we cannot bear it no longer. Then Jesus says to us, come, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. So Lord, we relinquish our rights to you. We lay down our burdens. We lay down our hurts. We lay down our circumstances. And as you heal us, we promise, we declare that we will serve you with the healing. But even if the healing does not come in the way that we want, we will still serve you, O oh God. We will still love and follow you, O oh God. Because your healing might be a different type of healing than we had hoped for. So Lord, we honor you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. And we pray that your grace would lead us to serve others well in a self-sacrificial way. And we love and honor you together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.